Richard Delasky issued his writ of summons challenging the constitutionality of the anti-LGBTQ bill, what is called the Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill 2024. And in the uh, pursuant to that, filed an application for interlocutory injunction. That case was filed on the 5th of March. Now, Honorable Roxanne Dafia Mapos suit was filed on the 18th of March, pursuant to which an application for interlocutory injunction was filed by him on the 21st of March, two clear weeks after Richard Delasky's writ was issued in the Supreme Court. Now we know that these two legal actions pending in the Supreme Court have created a standoff, a deadlock between the executive arm of government and the legislature for the simple reason that the president has indicated that he is not willing to accept a valid correspondence from the legislative arm of government. He is not willing to receive the transmission of the anti-LGBTQ bill from parliament, which the Speaker of Parliament is enjoined by the Constitution to do. So, by parity of reasoning, the Speaker of Parliament decided to abide by the thinking, the interpretation, the arguments of the President, even though I know that Mr. Speaker disagrees with that position. But he said, look, if this is what you're saying, then let's give you a dose of your own medicine and let's see how you feel. So, the Right Honorable Speaker also decided that by virtue of the fact that the Roxanne Dafiama Pox case was seeking to restrain Parliament from considering the latest ministerial nominations of the President, he was also going to put that on hold until the determination of the Dafiama Pox case. So this is the standoff, the political standoff that we have on our hands. One would have expected that these two important arms of government would have georgied, okay, and found a middle ground, found a compromise position in the interest of the people of this country. It does appear that the executive uh, is hell-bent on showing their power, you know, and so they are still standing by their entrenched position, that they were right. Be that as it may, we were expecting that since the De La Sky case, which government is very happy about because it affords the president the opportunity to shelve the anti-LGBTQ bill that he doesn't support, he opposes. It gives him the opportunity to shelve that. We would have expected that that suit would have been first to be listed for hearing. Unfortunately, the Dafia Mapok's case, which was filed two weeks prior to the Richie Sky case, was what was listed for hearing and actually heard yesterday relative to the interlocutory application for injunction. So this is the basis of our complaint. This is the basis of our criticism of the Chief Justice. We are saying that, Madam Chief Justice, you are not being fair. You are not being impartial as you ought to be. Yes, you have discretionary powers in the exercise of your administrative functions as the head of the judiciary. But you are enjoined by Article 296 to exercise that discretionary power in a fair manner. And in a manner that engenders confidence in the judiciary and our justice delivery system. You are not supposed to exercise that power whimsically, capriciously, or arbitrary. We think that the manner in which political cases are being heard, are being called, are being listed for hearing by this Chief Justice is very arbitrary and unfair. And we, so, we say so very forcefully. And we are demanding for a change. Because, look, this is not the first time. Um, you recall, in the processes leading to the approval of the, I believe, 2022 budget, if that is what had the E-Levy in it, you recall that Parliament at plenary disapproved of the budget. Subsequent to the disapproval of the budget, the rejection of the budget, if I can put it that way, 
the Parliament of Ghana reconsidered the budget and purported to rescind the rejection of the budget. At the time, the first Deputy Speaker, Honorable Joe Wise, was the one in the chair. And you recall that he decided to participate in the votes, even though he was the um, um, first Deputy Speaker presiding on the day. And that, for us, for those of us in the NDC, particularly uh, MPs in the minority caucus, that was unconstitutional. We thought that that was unacceptable. And that once the first Deputy Speaker was presiding, he lost his uh, voting right. But, and, and this matter was, you know, um, put before the Supreme Court. Because at the time, government thought that the back and forth on the approval of the budget was affecting, you know, its um, 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 plans, its projections, and investor confidence and all that, we saw an expeditious determination of the matter by the Supreme Court. The matter was dealt with expeditiously. We were all excited about it because we all want cases to be fast-tracked in our courts, particularly cases of public interest. Few weeks down the line, the E-Levy bill was put before Parliament. And based on certain decisions that the Supreme Court had made in the Justice Abdullahi case relative to quorum for decision-making in Parliament, we in the NDC took the position that Parliament didn't have the quorum for taking a decision on that matter. And therefore, the approval of the E-Levy was unconstitutional. That was, for me, a very plausible, a very watertight case. So some of our NDC members of Parliament went to the Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of the approval of the E-Levy. In 2022, that was when that rate was issued. Look, till date, the Chief Justice. So, it does appear to every, and, and this should be obvious to any objective mind, that when cases go to the Supreme Court that, are, that appear to be averse to the interests of this overbearing executive arm of government led by Nanado Dankwe Kufuado, the case is not dealt with with the same seriousness and alacrity that cases that the government is interested in are dealt with. And that is our worry. That is our worry. The Chief Justice must do better. What is happening is totally, totally unacceptable. Look, you've, you've seen the expeditious manner that the Supreme Court handled the case involving the Arsene of MP, Honorable uh, Quasin, relative to the constitutionality of, of, of his election as Member of Parliament for the Good People of Arsenov. I mean, application after application, the Supreme Court has been very expeditious in determining the issues. My friend and brother, Buja Genfi, filed a similar suit challenging the validity of the election of the Member of Parliament for Tolon. Doc, I'm sure you remember that suit. Honorable Habib, on grounds that the Honorable Member allegedly has been convicted of fraud in Australia, and for that matter, is unqualified to be Member of Parliament. And if you check the case, I mean, very watertight, he's attached all the necessary pieces of evidence that shows that indeed there was that conviction related to fraud involving that Member of Parliament. The case was filed in the Supreme Court years ago, Doc, till date, till date. It's been a running back and forth battle between Bruja, his lawyers, and the Registry of the Supreme Court. Even getting a cover letter from the Registry of the Supreme Court to serve Parliament through the clerk of Parliament has been, you know, an endless back and forth battle between his lawyers and the registry and to date the member of parliament has not been served the registry of the supreme court they don't care they claim that they have written a letter to the clerk of parliament addressed to the speaker for the member of parliament to be served 
Bojaj and Fee and his lawyers have asked the registry to just furnish them with a copy of that letter. Doc, can you believe that to date, they have not even been kind to give them a copy of that letter so that they can follow up. And the Supreme Court is not interested in granting an application for substituted service. So it's like, we know that there is merit in this case, so we won't even call the case. This cannot be happening in any democracy. Everybody, irrespective of their political affiliation, should be able to assess our courts and assess justice expeditiously. You see, what is very interesting in this discussion about the Dafia Makos case and all that is the revelation from no, no less a person than the Attorney General and Minister of Justice. And Doc, I'm sure you've been following that keenly. Yesterday, when some media men sought to find out from the Attorney General, how come the Dafia Makos case against the President's ministerial nominations has been head first ahead of Richard Delasky's case against uh, the Speaker of Parliament, the transmission of the anti-LGBTQ bill. The Attorney General responded that he applied to the Chief Justice for the Dafia Mapos case to be expedited. He says so. He's captured on audio that he applied. So uh, in an interview later, in the day yesterday on Top Story with our director legal, Eduji Temaklo, Evan Spencer asked the Attorney General that what was the manner of this application? Because, Doc, yes, when cases are filed in court and a party in the case wants the matter expedited, they can file a formal application to the court for an expeditious determination of the matter or for the abridgment of time. But such applications must be on notice. All other parties must be notified. They must be served and they must come. They must also be heard on that application. That is the rule. So we checked with Honorable Roxen's lawyer, lawyers for the speaker, and they had not been served with any such application for an expedited you know, uh, determination of the matter. So Evans Benson found, asked the Attorney General, how, what was the form of this application? Then to our amazement, the Attorney General says, I wrote a letter to the Chief Justice. Then I do the ask him, did you copy the other parties in the case? He says, no. Completely unacceptable. This constitutes ex party communication with the Chief Justice by a party in the case without any notice whatsoever to the other parties. And, and what is even annoying about the whole thing is that when this man, who is supposed to be not only be an attorney general, but a minister of justice, minister of justice, was asked whether he's, he would take the same interest in the Delasky case and apply to the chief justice to expedite that matter, he told the journalist that he was playing to the gallery by asking him that question. And yet, when the likes of Franklin Kujo says that this is the worst attorney general we have ever had, a minister for injustice and not a minister for justice, he is offended. He is not interested in fairness, equality of treatment to parties before the courts. He is not interested in justice. He is there as a political apparatchik, you know, doing the bidding of a despotic political regime. It is very sad. But we are not going to be quiet, and nobody can blackmail us to, into silence. Madam Chief Justice, until this changes, we will not stop criticizing you. Mm. You are not above criticism. You know that justice emanates from the people of this country. And the judiciary is supposed to administer justice for and on behalf of this, the people of this country. And what the people of this country want is fairness, is justice. Why is it that the E-Lady e case has not been listed for hearing? Why is it that the registry of the Supreme Court is frustrating the service of the writ which has been issued challenging the constitutionality of the election of the Tolon MP? Why is it that you are not interested in listing for hearing the Richard Delasky case which was filed two weeks prior to the case of Dafia Mapo, which you have heard yesterday at least relative to the interlocutory application for injunction? We deserve better and we demand better. Mm. But aside that, 
I totally disagree with the Supreme Court that proper service was made in the case of Dafia Mapo. Because I've seen the CCTV footage. I was not in court, but at least I've heard media reports of what the bailiff testified before that court on oath. And I want to let the bailiff know that for testimony under oath is tantamount to perjury. So if you go and tell the revered justices of the Supreme Court that you went to the chambers of the lawyer, our own brother Nick Papu, lawyer for Dafia Mapo, and that they refused to take a process from you and all that, when you do that was not the case. The registrar, or I think the bailiff of the court, had called the lawyer. The lawyer said I was out of town, serve my client, and actually forwarded his client's contact to the registrar, or I think the bailiff. For some strange reasons, the bailiff decided to go to the lawyer's office. He went there and just dropped the process on the table. And the receptionist said, my boss is not around. When you are serving a process, the one you are serving must sign for it. So can you let us reach out to him so that you serve him personally for him to sign to it? He says, let me step out and consult my boss. He steps out and doesn't return again. And the Supreme Court says this is service. Now what he told the Supreme Court, according uh -huh. to the reports we received, was that the lady who he named as Na mm -hmm. told him that the boss has asked not has asked her not to accept any processes from the court. No. Now, this, uh, I'm saying that well, but this is what we Nick Papo has that, granted interviews yeah. and he has said that is not true. Yeah. He only said that for, for any process, you know, relative to that particular case, he should be said personally. Mm. So that is all the receptionists. And that is not, it's not, you know, irregular at all mm. for senior lawyers in a law office to say that. I work in the chamber. That is regular pl uh, practice. But even if the bailiff disagreed, he should have come back and said, no, so accept the service. You know, and if the receptionist refused, he could have done what he did. But I think what happened was not right at all. Finally, what I would say is that um, I'm happy with the decision the court has reached. It is a decision I agree with. It is a decision that is in my opinion, sound in law that no constitutional body or public office holder can be injuncted from the performance of his public duty, especially constitutional duties mm. by the courts, unless it can be demonstrated that that office holder or that institution is engaged in the violation of the Constitution, and that if he is not injuncted, an irreparable damage will be done to the applicants, that the courts may not be able to remedy upon the final determination of the case. But we know that as far as laws are concerned, any applicant for an interlocutory injunction or any plaintiff challenging the constitutionality of any law can eventually get justice because of Article 2 and 130 of the 1992 Constitution with vest jurisdiction in the Supreme Court to declare as null and void any law that is inconsistent with the Constitution of Ghana to the extent of its inconsistency with the Constitution of Ghana. And so, the Supreme Court is right. They were right in the Amanda Ondo case relative to the first interlocutory injunction which sought to restrain Parliament from proceeding with the consideration of the anti-LGBTQ bill. And in that ruling, they said that you cannot injunct parliament from exercising its constitutional powers in making laws. Let them finish making the law. When the law comes into effect and you think it's unconstitutional, you can still come to us for declaratory reliefs relative to that. And I think the decision by the court yesterday is consistent with that. And so by parity of reasoning, I don't see how in the case of Richard Della Sky, the Supreme Court can say that Parliament can be restrained from performing its constitutional duty of transmitting a bill it has passed to the, uh, to the President of Ghana. So it, for me, it even renders that case moot because that this, the ratio of this ruling can be applied like the lawyers say, mutatis mutandis, to the case of Richard Della Sky because they are materially
the same. But finally, finally, Doc, we are in this quagma, this political quandary, this political, you know, deadlock, because President Ekufuado and the ruling MPP, President Ekufuado, ably supported by his vice, Alaji Bawumia, are determined to oppose and frustrate the coming into effect of the anti-gay bill. The Center for Democratic um, CDD, what's the full name? Center for Democratic what? Development. Development. They've told us publicly that the president has given them his full blessing for them to oppose the anti-LGBTQ bill. So all the things that the pretense the president has been putting up, deceiving Christians and Muslims in this country, that he is against gayism, homosexuality and all that. Today he's been exposed. And that is how come that even a day before Richard Delasky filed his application in the Supreme Court, the president by some magical powers already knew. In fact, he lied on the 4th of March that the case had been filed when that was not the case because he's the one sponsoring it. He's the one motivating, sponsoring all the opposition from civil society, from people like Richard Delasky against the bill. Mr. President, be bold. Be bold. You have already told us that homosexuality is bound to happen in Ghana. If your position has not changed, and you don't want the coming into force of a law passed unanimously by the representatives of the people to come into effect, you want homosexuality to be promoted, say that. Accept that transmission. Refuse to assent. The people's representatives in parliament who do the need for by mobilizing the needed to third majority to pass the law, in which case you will not have any discretion to refuse the assent of the bill. And stop playing these games because it is not healthy for our democracy for this standoff to linger. And the judiciary, and let me not even say the judiciary, it's not fair to say the judiciary, the chief justice must not come across as aiding the president to have an upper hand in this impasse with parliament. That is detrimental to public confidence in that respectable, that important arm um, of government, the judiciary. Okay.